when they first came to me and asked me if I wanted to do the history detectives, which was probably in about 2002, I assured them that I was engaged in work that was far more important than doing something on television, which after all was doing nothing but making people come. And that I myself was engaged in a higher call. I was doing very important work. I was doing research and after I was always talking to people who were important. And we were making things happen so that the process of being on television would be many steps down. I the phone. A couple of days later, she calls back, and she's even more excited about me doing it. And I tell her again, I'm not interested in this. And she insists that you know I would be good at this. They saw something where I was good at this kind of thing, and they thought that I should actually do this because it would be a good thing. <laughs> For television, it would be a good thing for me. It would allow me to talk to a lot of people. And I assured her that this was not something I was interested in. I had very important projects, which included, uh, you know, working with ministers in African countries, heads of state, and organizing programs to educate students. And being on television was the last thing on my mind. And I assured her that I would not do it. I gave her the list of names of several of my colleagues. And these colleagues, uh, she promised she would call. And I was happy. I hung up the phone and got back to work on my serious work. Then three weeks later, I found myself standing in six feet of snow filming my first episode of the history of television. I will not bore you with the details of how they convinced me that uh, I should give this a try, but I gave it a try. And the process was quite illuminating in terms of what happened behind the camera. But what really sold me on the process was the first time that they aired one of the episodes of the History of the Text. They aired the episode, I watched it, I was thoroughly embarrassed. <laughs> and then the next day, although PBS does not care about ratings, this is not a thing that they pay any attention to, uh, but that next morning I got the ratings. And they don't care about the minute by minute ratings because they're above that, but I got those minute by minute up ratings at any rate. And I was totally taken aback by the three point something that we received in a rating because I had seen that the football games got as high as 20, and I was wondering, where were the people? Why didn't the masses tune in? This was definitely more important than the Emmys I was on television. And I was a little disappointed until they told me what three-point something means. And when they told me what three-point something means, like it, it means it translates into you know, four or five million people, I was like, four or five million people? And then I became a little more intimidated, and I went back to look, what exactly did I say to all of these people? <laughs> who I began to encounter in my daily life and whenever I went anywhere. And so what I was actually doing in the medium became more important to me. And I thought, since I have this access to so many people, and I have this uh, apparent ability which I didn't know I had to communicate in this way, I should take upon myself the responsibility of doing something effective. And I have remained engaged and involved in this process of producing information and circulating that information to large numbers of people in the public. I primarily see myself as an educator, so I don't do this simply because I look good, or because I wear nice clothes, or because I know how to set up and make a film. I do it because my vocation, as I understand it, is to educate. And I think that education can take and come in many forms. The problem that I see myself trying to work out is can we engage in a kind of education of the public about issues which are relevant to their everyday lives and that in some ways prepare
prepares them to ask hard questions and to engage in critical activities to transform their world. I know that may sound a little idealistic to you guys in the era of Facebook, Twitter, and all of those other social spaces that we spend most of our time engaging in. However, for me, this is still and remains a, a very in, in important kind of question. So today I'd like to talk to you about something that I'm calling film sociology, and that I see as a space for a kind of critical sociology, a way to engage people in understanding their world in a more, uh, uh, in, in a way that allows them to critique it and make it better. Uh, can we have a sociology like that which is uh, available to people? And you know, and a lot of times I look at the news and I look at lots of documentaries and all this stuff. And, you know, and I'm not jealous of the economists or anything, but if you try to read their stuff, it's less intelligible. I know some sociology is really unintelligible, but it's less intelligible than uh, some of the sociology. But these guys get all the play, and they can talk about every single subject. In fact, they have colonized everything the sociologists think that they are supposed to study, from the family to development. I mean, there is no space sacred for the sociologists anymore. So I decided that I'm going to do just the opposite. That other people's territory, I will not make it a sacred space, and I will make no question that I cannot pursue and try to address using the battery of information that I have, I have consumed as my sociological imagination has kind of come into play. So I want to define the meaning of what I'm talking about when I say uh, sociological film and why I think it's important for the cultural, uh, cultural space that we now occupy. I want to talk about the kinds of films that sociology can offer using the sociological imagination. And I use film here very loosely because I still do television and the history of detectives, which has been on for 11 seasons, continues to, how many of you all watch uh, uh, history detectives. To the few of you all, I love you. Thank you very much. We still on the air. You people who haven't looked at it, it's online. History detectives. Just type it in. It'll come up. You can watch episodes going back for seven years online. The ones before that didn't get the right copyrights or something. It's not there. But you can almost catch up and you can find out why we why we love watching the history detectives. So the history detectives, uh, and, and you know, and, and this is the history detectives. I'll, I'll tell you all this. So when it comes back on, you see a whole bunch of new people, uh, and me and, and Wes. That it started out with this. Well, it started out with uh, the four people besides uh, Eduardo who came on uh, two years ago, and then now they just changed the whole format, and so it's uh, Wes and I and, and another woman that they just brought on, and the format has changed so that we're doing. Uh, one hour documentaries on a specific topic, a kind of unresolved historical mystery in which we're going in to kind of uncover the social context and, and giving, giving that thing. See, I told you I'm challenging stuff. The history detectives, I'm a sociologist and doing a history detective. You might say, why would a sociologist be doing a history detective? And I say, well, why wouldn't a sociologist be doing the history detective? Ha! <laughs> And, uh, but, I, you know, the, 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 the kind of work I do in the academy is, is very critical sociology. It's, trend, it's kind of the sociology that challenges what sociology is about. Uh, a, a, one book that I wrote, and I wrote a few books, but one book I wrote is called Thicker Than Blood, uh, which is How Racial Statistics Lie. Now, I've done a tremendous amount of statistical work. Uh, I had a colleague in Columbia just asked me to send them all the stuff I wrote on slavery and the number of slaves and the slave trade. And as I was gathering, by the time I got to seven articles, I was like, I forgot I wrote all of this stuff, challenging all of this. Because when I was doing it and writing it, nobody was paying any attention to it. And I was very impressed that a colleague from Columbia would want it because she was getting ready to participate on a UN commission to investigate what the kind of underpinnings of the slave trade was all about. 
So that scholarship has continued to be important. But my place in the academy has been to be very, very critical. So I have written, I, after doing a lot of statistical analysis, I wrote a critique of the use of statistical analysis. Uh, and, you know, I've con I continue to do some of that work, although uh, my work in film and other public arenas has grown tremendously and that has pulled me in different directions. But I see myself as bringing the two together, basically. So I want to go towards making a definition of film sociology. Some of you will finish that definition and show me how it's wrong and all that other stuff, but I'm sure because that's the way the academic sphere works. Um, and I'll use as an example uh, my film, African Independence, uh, which is the I, so my strategy in making films is this, and I learned this from Tom Woods. Uh, Tom Woods is a film, a British filmmaker, who is a, a PhD in anthropology, and he's made a number of, of films. He did The Story of India. I don't know if PBS dedicated people. How many of y'all saw The Story? <laughs> okay, let's, we got that. We gave him some love. Um, but one of the things uh, that he told me, he said, Never film one film, because you can't film it. Uh, so if you're going to film, and, and he said this is easy for us, because what do we have? We have lots of ideas. Most filmmakers can't find an idea, and they come to talk to us about their ideas when they get one. But if they have one, they definitely need it. But we're full of ideas. We can't, we don't run out of ideas. We have all kinds of ideas that we haven't even had a chance to study yet. So always make two films. Uh, so I did. I made two of them. That's why the one you see is just the first one. We're already editing the second one. We said always make two films. And so the, the, the process of making the films fills up a very big space because you are constantly involved in some level of the production. But let me take a step back from the actual process to talk about what motivates me within this process. And here's what I have to say about that. So this is my perspective. I come as a very empirical social scientist. But I'm a kind of empirical social scientist whose empiricism actually led them to be much more theoretical. And at this, when, after I finished writing this book, which was a critique of statistics, all the theory departments around the country was, come on, we, need, we want to talk to you about the implications this has for the theory. And that was a book which was a critique of method, but it was a critique of the theory behind the use of the methods and the importance for understanding how theory drives those methods. So for me, the empirical and the theoretical are always in they're linked in a fundamental way. In such a fundamental way that, in fact, the theory guides what the empirical thinks they can understand. And I know that's pretty, uh, pretty dense in terms of the relationship between methods and theory, and it's very abstract. But I think it becomes very obvious when we understand the role of biography in the process of history. So we know that historical things happen. We might imagine that there was something called World War II. And we may think that that war was transformative in terms of what it did for international relationships and what it did for the creation of uh, specific nation states. And we may have all of those ideas, but there is no way to imagine that historical event occurring without the individual biographies of the people who actually participated in that process in one way or another. That is, it was not one general. A general fighting by himself would be interesting. Okay? A lot less people would die. Put them in a ring, put them in a cage. They could have guns, swords, and knives, and everything. Talk about, you know, what is it, UFC? This could be another whole thing. The WFC, and let them fight to the death. That is not how it happens. The generals are usually very, very protected. And it is the people, the men and women who are out there fighting, it is their individual biographies aggregated along with the generals and everybody else's that gives us this thing that we call history. I must say that the, 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 the 
mystery detectives, I mean, you know, some people criticize it for being a little corner, but it got this right. It got this right. And the reason it got it right is when they first started the show, I raised this as a fundamental point. I would say you cannot do history without understanding the biography of the individuals involved. And in fact, this gives us a better way to talk about things. For example, once I did an episode on Lindbergh and his plane that flew across the Atlantic Ocean. And what did we focus on? Not Lindbergh. We focused on the guy that made Lindbergh's engine. We found the guy, we found where he made the engine at, we found all kinds of stuff out about this particular guy. Now the logic of that is, you know, mind-boggling. Lindbergh, no engine, no flight. Now, Lindbergh could have done a lot of things, but if he didn't have that engine in that plane, he doesn't make that flight. So the biography of the individual who made the engine is what we focus on. Hence, that biography comes out as a major point in history leading to this major discovery or major process or major feat, major accomplishment in aviation that would have impacts on us all leading up to today and to space flight and all of that other stuff. Now, often uh, people ask, how can I, because the qualitative level of the work that I do, if you saw the film, it's even probably more qualitative than most ethnographers do, you know, because people will do stuff, but I go talk to people and I show you exactly what they say. Now there's a lot of stuff, just like with the ethnographers, that I cut off, shave off, and throw it on the floor. And what you see is the result of the editing, which is a result of what I think, which means that the film gives you my perspective. And I use the narratives and the voices of those individuals who are in the film to kind of tell that particular story. The quantitative nature of, of my own training and my own practice up until about 12 years ago, or a little bit more than that, was a result of what I thought was important to understand humanity. I still do some of that work, but as I said, it's, it's, it's quite reduced. But my major point here with all of these juxtapositions is to suggest that there is a lot to be understood by doing a very deep narrative focus on the people who are supposed to be the actors in the major social processes that we live. And that understanding them is important. It's not that the scholars are not important, but understanding them is important. I, for the uh, film African Independence, for example, I not only had a very big, and I, I think it was important, intellectual conference. But we published a journal from that intellectual conference, which was people commenting on the idea of what I was going to film. And from that critique, along with listening to the people, is how I came up with even the title of the film, because it started out with a totally different uh, title. So this kind of deep narrative that I'm talking about is, I think, something that is very, very important. Because the narrative that I'm talking about is not just a written narrative, although it's good to have a written narrative that guides you. It is a visual narrative. It's a visual narrative of scholarship. And it is a way of taking the visual and working with the idea of how do you display how do you present these written kinds of arguments? So I read all kinds of stuff on development, on Africa, on the whole country. And I've been working in Africa for many years. And so I, I wasn't coming at this very naively. And I was trying to tell something with the images that I showed and in the way that I showed. So some of it was important. Uh, well, I had dinner with one of my colleagues. We had a screening at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, at Harrison Hall, about 800 people came. And that, the next day I, I sat with a few of my colleagues and we were talking about the, the film. And one of the women said, you know, your film did not look like Africa. I wanted to see more of Africa in the film. And I said, but it was all, every single second, filmed in Africa. Some of the archival footage was not of Africa, of course, World War II. 
do is that Japan is in Europe and stuff like that. Some of the speeches before making them in the UN is on the front line of the White House. But all of the stuff you see me filming, I am in Africa. And she said, well, it didn't look like Africa. And I said, you've been to Africa? She said, no. And I said, well, how do you know what Africa looks like? She said, because I know. because it, it, but, And so finally, she said, you, you, didn't, you didn't go anywhere where there were trees and there were animals. Everything you shot was like in the city. And Africa isn't that developed. It's developed. I know there's cities, but you could have gone out and gave us a better sense of the real Africa. So not showing what for her was the real Africa on my part was intentional, okay? Because I did not want to present that face of Africa. And I knew I was not going to just give a taste of every single country on the African continent. So I did not show her comprehensively every country I could have shown. I made some very serious choices and selected a very small number of countries. And I focused on them to tell what sociologists tend to do is a very broad story, which, of course, did not get the specifics right for the specific countries that were not there, and may have not even gotten all the specifics right for the countries that were there, but it tried to make a point about what African independence was. Now, there's a play with the visual and the sound as well, because what you see registers information in your head. What you hear registers information in your head. And so people who make films master playing these things off of each other. And there's a whole literature uh, in film theory about how do you do this. Some of it written by filmmakers, some of it written by theorists, some of it written by postmodernist theorists who I don't understand because I'm just, they're, they're smarter than me or something, but their language is definitely uh, not one that's easy to grasp. It was, it was popular one moment, now it's not as popular, so I guess I learned to talk some of that, and now it's wasted, so I don't <laughs> But the, the play off of the visual and the sound is a very important space, and how you use that makes a difference. What music do you use? How powerful do you make the music? Do you allow the music to drown out the visual image? Do you allow the image to kind of contradict the music? Do you shake people with the music in order to carry them along to the next space, the next place? I remember the first time we showed the film publicly was in San Diego, at the San Diego Black Film Festival. And when we showed it, you know, then a hundred people showed up, I was really getting afraid then because I was like, oh, these hundred people. And I hope they stay in. The movie is almost two hours long, shorter than Batman, but you know, it still is almost two hours long, shorter than The Avengers, but it's, you know, one hour and 57 minutes and 17 seconds long. It's shorter than every major science fiction movie that's come on television. But I thought, you know, people don't have the attention span to sit here and listen to somebody talk about Africa, a place which they already have the image they want to see. And halfway in, they're going to get tired because they don't see any trees. There's not a lot of lions and there's not elephants. There are lions and elephants in Africa and there are trees in Africa. But this was not a film about the trees, the lions, the elephants, or what have you. It was a film about a very important movement. A movement which I would contend is the most important thing to happen on the African continent in the 20th century. So the kind of filmmaking then that I'm saying is important for sociology and important for kind of a sociological imagination, if you will, is a filmmaking which is narrative. That is, it is, a, it is trying to tell a narrative which uh, helps us understand our world by pointing to the importance of, of a historical understanding on one hand, but helps us place this historical understanding within a context. And for me, this is what social history does well. It allows us not only to understand the idiomatic but it gives us some nomothetic ways of placing these idiomatic things together. <laughs> yeah, I didn't expect those two words. <laughs> Let me tell you what I said. So what I think that social history allows us to do is take the picture of the past, the idiomatic, 
take that particular flash of a thing that you're looking at and then to place it in a context which says here are the patterns in history so that we can understand what has happened without understanding all of the little pictures because you can't see all of the little pictures. I'll give you an example. A very famous painting in the Philadelphia Museum of Art is called The Morris Chief. Okay? When it was first uh, painted and, and hung in the salon in France in 18, I think it was 82, it was called basically the guard of the harem. Okay? Uh, but it's not the harem, it's the place where the harem is, because the harem is actually the women in the space where it was, but that's what it was called. And then, but however, by the time the guy brought it, Johnson, I think is his name, and brought it to Philadelphia, they changed the name because, you know, the war is cheap. And you look at the guy, and the guy, is, he's standing there, he has this beautiful flowing white robe on a building which is Alhambra. And he's there, and he has a sword taken from its case, and it's with his right hand, and he's pointing it down. And then he has another bejeweled knife in his belt. Right? And he's standing there and he's looking regal. He kind of looks like me a little bit. If you were taking the gray stuff out of my beard, some of you probably were thinking that as I was saying that. And he points it down and he's there and he's just looking really, really cool. I mean, even though this is kind of supposed to be of some other place in some other period. That is an idiomatic description of that particular image, that particular picture. If I did a good job, you have some image of that from those words in your head. Now, if I was to then talk to you about how he was going against some of the painting conventions at that time, you would have to be able to imagine other pieces of art. That is, you would have to be able to singly imagine them and compare to how that is, is very different from it. Well, what I'm trying to suggest to you is that the, the looking at him and pointing it down to his toe is not necessarily the story that I am trying to tell. I'm, I think the details are important, but the story that I want to tell is more of what is the flavor of having him in that picture? Why would he be there? Why would there be a, an African guarding a palace in Spain? Why was Spain why would Spain need such a guy? Why would that resonate in Europe? Because it was very popular in Europe. It was very popular in the United States, this one particular image. That requires contextualizing that particular image within history and understanding the Moors, their concrete of Spain, what that meant, what that did to the mind of the people in Spain, how that led to the whole kind of chases of the bulls and the bullfighting and kind of the cultural uh, outflow that would come from Spain and go all over the Americas, right? And all of those things probably you never heard of or you never seen those clear cuts and directions, but they live and they kind of emanate from images like this which survive and they tell this story around uh, the world. So for me then, a very important part of the evidence that can be used in filmmaking is archival footage. Because archival footage is not used in this way, actually, in a lot of documentaries. In a lot of documentaries, it's used in the idiomatic way. That is, you see the thing. It is not used in the way as evidence that something happened. Because it's not often that everybody goes in it with narrative. There is that old verite idea that people, some people are working with, that I'm capturing reality because I point the camera and I just let it happen. And then I take from what it happens and I cut up to, to make what the thing is. I don't think that's impossible. Because it's a little bitty camera. It only, and if you look through the thing, like you see how you, this looks, you can't make the camera show you this. So what the camera these guys do, they, they say, OK, this is important. This is how we're going to make the scene look. This is how we're going to dress it. If they don't even touch it, they just point the camera there. By pointing the camera here, they've cut all of this out. And they have to cut it out, because they can't show every single thing. That requires a choice. By making those kinds of choices, they're telling a story. And for me, it's better to know what story you're going to tell beforehand, rather than act like you're just making it up as you go. Both cases, you're telling a story, you're creating a narrative. 
But using archival footage in this way gives it a way of being kind of the historical documentation that actually happened. And for many events, this is very important. Because, you know, a lot of people would say, How did, what role did Africans play in World War I? People don't know millions of Africans participated in World War I. There's actually archival footage of it. You've got to find it. It's difficult to find, but you can find it. What role did Africans play in World War II? There is archival footage to show what role they played in, in World War II. And so in this way, I think that provides a source of evidence which helps uh, illuminate on particular events. Reenactments are another way of providing historical evidence of what has happened. Often we have a record of some particular event, and you can use a reenactment to do that. In the history of detectives, we use reenactments a lot. In a project that I'm working on now, we just discovered a painting that was done in 1832 in, uh, in, in San Jose, which is next to El Carmen in Lima. This painting was done in 1832 by an enslaved African, and it depicts the kind of life that occurred in the plaza on a plantation. And so from this, you've got certain cultural practices in Lima which date back to this. That is, they're saying they're, they're capturing this particular thing. So it is right for reenactment. And when you talk to the people, they say, oh, yeah, yeah, we're connected to those kinds of practices, and this is what we do. And they, they can show you some dances. They can show you some things. And uh, they, in, in one part, there's a bull in it. This is an important part. The, and anybody know about Peru in here? Okay. You know about the folk song in Peru? No. <laughs> so the, the big folk, folk song in Peru is uh, Toro Mata. Anybody speak Spanish in here? Toro Mata. You know what that means? So Toro Mata. The bull kills. This is a, a, a big thing there. And what happened, this is the story they tell. This is the story that black people in Peru tell. Is that they sung this song on plantation. Then the mestizos would come and they would steal the song every 25 years or so. Take it to the city and get famous with it. And they did that on and off until by the, you know, it was the national folk song of Peru. And then in the 70s, there was a movement of consciousness and the black people reclaimed it. And they reclaimed this song, which is still now widely covered in terms of musicians who know about the movement sing the song of Peru, and they sing this particular song. You'll see, you'll go Google it, Toromata, everybody, you know, lots of people have sung it, and it's a very beautiful song. Um, you got to listen to it, and it, it is a beautiful song. So, reenactments are another way of capturing uh, the historical past and providing evidence of things that have happened in the past. Now, I think that there is a, a role for the uh, sociological theory here, and I think, you know, in part, uh, this is kind of the, the idiomatic versus the nomothetic considerations that I mentioned before, but also, you know, can we generalize from a standpoint? And I think it depends on which standpoint you're generalizing from. Definitely, it could be your own, which I think is part of what we do whenever we talk, whenever we try to communicate a message. But also, you can try to identify the historic actors which had a very, or played a pivotal role in some kind of social transformation, and juxtapose their particular standpoint to other spaces and other places, and how that may have influenced the trajectory of history, or where we end up and how we get, get somewhere. And then, understanding the context in which the actions took place, or the social processes took place. And this is what we try to do with, uh, with African independence. Now, a last point is producing as authorship. And I think this is important. Uh, first, let me just say, and this is, this, that's important, I think, because there was a, a filmmaker who just got a PhD in sociology, and she could not find a job. She could not buy a job. She had produced three films, and she said she had to tell people she had to not tell it that she had the films. Because when she would go to sociology departments and she'd say she had the films, they're like, you're not doing scholarship. What are you doing? Making films? What is that? We're not, it's, we don't have that. Anthropologists actually do. They kind of can give you some, some play on the whole film thing. 
Sociologists don't necessarily do. Now, if you're in my position, I understand my position is different. I got tenure, I got a chair, I got a distinguished chair. I was the chair of my department until a few months ago. So that the, the process is a little bit different for me. And I came into making films at, after I had all of that stuff. That is, I didn't become a full professor because nobody gave me, nobody gave me a promotion because of the, the great films that I made or because I was on the history of tech. So all of that came came kind of after. I think, I think that slide is actually out of place. So, <clears throat> producing with scholarship in mind, which is, and I'll go through this quickly and then I'll give you an example and then I'll be done and I'll take your question. So I want to talk about, and this just gives us a language to talk about. Producer as author of a visual narrative uh, for a closely watched film. And a closely watched film is this. It's a, any film where you actually have to pay attention to what people are saying and doing and the narrative of the story. Because uh, you can do a film where that's not important. And the way you do it with a film that's just not important is you have to have loud explosions, people have to be killed in gruesome manners, or you have to have a really powerful kiss or other kind of sexually involved activity. Because those things will really snap people's attention back. I mean, if, you know, one hand, you got people walking down the street, and the next thing, they're in bed, they look cool, the bed is cool, they're cool, they're fine, you want to just show a little bit more, show a little bit more, they never show you that little bit more, unless you're looking at a different kind of film, you kind of, that's how you can draw people in. But the other kind of film is one where you actually have to follow the film to understand it. Now, those are the kind of films that I am interested in making. And I'm interested in making those films not just for classes, although all of my films do have kind of a classroom educational version that goes along with a book and all of that other stuff. I am making them for a general audience to look at them and hopefully learn something from it going back to the first stuff that I, I said. So how does, a, how does this work? You can make a film for an academic audience, you can make a film for a public audience, or you can make a film for popular culture. And sometimes these things bleed into each other. All kinds of people teach The Matrix, for example, or they teach some other popular film as a way of trying to connect with their students and, 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 and be relevant and, and all those kinds of things. Okay. Just because I do that sometimes, I'm not saying that I stoop to that level of stuff. The sociological science and art of documentary filmmaking I think is very important. That is, for me, it's important to understand the science of understanding society. That's important. And if you don't understand that, then you're going to not be in a position to, you can accidentally do it, and some people have accidentally done a great job for it, but that is not going to be why you go in it, and that is not going to be the nature of what you put out. But it's equally important is the art of filmmaking. I didn't go to film school. I didn't go to art school. The place that I learned to make films was on the set. And this is like following people who did go to art school and did go to film school. Even though I was there, they were filming me. The moment they were not, I spent a year. I said, okay, this year I'm focusing on sound. And I would read sound theory. I would come back and bounce this off of these guys. And they would look at me strange like, what? <laughs> How did you know this about the machine? And I got into tinkering with the thing. So that I can understand the sound. Then I would do the, 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 you know, the camera, the visual. Why one camera versus two cameras versus three cameras? What does it do? How does it change the process? How does it change what people, people see? So understanding both the subject matter and the possibilities of what you can get from that and the art of filming, I think, are two of the things that have to go together. Now, African studies is one of the areas I work in. Sociology is another one of the areas that I work in. And the art of documentary film uh, making in these spaces has occurred. That is, I'm not the first sociologist to want to make a film. I'm definitely not the first person interested in African studies to make a film. And many people have done great films. And so in some ways, I'm trying to contextualize even some of their work and give meaning to it in this abstract, uh, intellectual way. I'm still making films, but somehow I feel like I need to be able to teach it too. And I know maybe it's a contradiction. You know, it's supposed to be those who do don't teach, and those who teach don't do. But I'm trying to teach and do at the same time. Um, all right. Uh, all right. 
here's, here's my most technical part of this whole thing. And I have to make sense of this, okay? Because I'm a scholar, and that's what we do. We try to make sense of stuff. And so what I'm doing is important for me to make sense of stuff. So I need to understand agency in this kind of art of documentary filmmaking. And so I look at it from the point of view of me. How do I participate in this process? I am in front of the camera. I am behind the camera. Uh, so in a sense, I do both. But you don't have to do both, and one could choose to do one or the, or the other. I just do both because uh, I'm enjoying doing it. Maybe at some point I want. And now the scholar acts as an authority uh, in films. There's the godlike voice. You all hear that godlike voice when you can't see the face. And they say, in 1959, it's a decisive moment. And you say, oh, wow, pay attention. This is the decisive moment. I didn't pay. I went to sleep for a minute. Now the decisive moment. You never see the person. You don't know their voice. You can't connect them. They are God. And they speak like a God speaking down to you, mere mortals, and they give you a fact on which you follow the narrative that they are offering you. Now, then there's those scholars who just lecture in front of the camera. They, just, they point a camera like that at them, and they just give a lecture. And hopefully it's a nice lecture. If they're an exciting lecturer, then you, you, know, you don't go to sleep. But the camera does not capture this interaction that we're having right now. Because the camera only captures what the person is saying. And it doesn't capture the dimensions of how I am actually responding to some of the faces that you guys are making. Or, you know, if you go to sleep, I'm looking at you, trying to give you that sleep stare thing that wakes you up and brings you back in. So it doesn't capture all of those kinds of dynamics. Uh, but the scholar is speaking directly to the viewer. And that's when the person will turn their attention to the camera, and then they will say something directly into the camera. Now that, for some documentary filmmakers, that's kind of a wall, and you don't cross that wall. You never look into the camera. And that's why you will look at the film, and you know, the person will be sitting there by themselves, and they'll be saying, yes, what I don't think is that this was the important process. And they never look at you. You're the audience, and they're talking to somebody, and you never see the person they're talking to. So they're kind of like talking off screen, but you accept this particular mode of communication as an authority speaking to the person making the film, who even though you don't see them, you kind of imagine them and take that as a legitimate space for them to communicate and talk. And then there's the expert as authority. So the expert talks to um, Godlike. Right? So the, the, and that's the issue. You know, he's looking here, he's talking to the guy like the guy you don't see. And then the expert in conversation with the scholar. And, and that you can often see is where they're both in front of the camera. And which is the style that I prefer because I don't like the whole kind of godlike reference. And so I do the VO, but you know, you know it's me because you can hear the voice you connect it to. And I think it's important to do that because it gives you a different taste of the film. You may not notice it, but it does it and you carry that along with you. Now, so this is a project that I have. And uh, so here, what I was trying to do is make my first film. It took me seven years to make this film, because it took me seven years to figure out how to make it. Uh, and throughout the whole process, everybody was telling me I wasn't a filmmaker. And then after I, I made the film, they were still telling me I wasn't a filmmaker. Then after it, Filmmakers start telling me it's a good film, and they start giving me awards for the film. And then they start saying, okay, you're a filmmaker, but you know, this is what you need to fix this thing and that. And then finally it boiled down to, and I, I did fix a lot of the stuff that gives, they told me. So I got a lot of good comments from filmmakers once they accepted that I was a filmmaker. Now they accept that I'm a filmmaker. Um, it's, and, and, you know, that, and that's a list of some of the awards. Isn't that cool? For the first film that I made. I did not expect anybody to think that it was a good film, but me and my son who was, you know, working with me. And he went to film school, and so he knows a lot of things about that. So I broke the film down into four pieces, which are not mentioned in the film because we want the film to organically carry you through these four pieces. And I believe I, I, my first inclination was to put these spots in. It's in there for the educational version. But for your general audience version, believe, me or, believe it or not, it makes people get bored. When you tell them a 
okay, now I got four chapters, you're a chapter too long. God, it's, <laughs> you know, when is this dude going to go? I broke it down into a discussion of colonialism and talked about the relevance of Pan-Africanism to the end of colonialism, then the end of the colonial rule in Africa, and how the Cold War really was something that hurt Africa. It harmed Africa greatly. Because the Cold War was not fought non-violently on the African continent. It meant war. And then how that past melts into the future. Not necessarily so much of what it is now, because there's a lot of problems and things, but where does this take Africa? What does it offer Africa as a potential uh, place to go? So my notion is a kind of film, which is between the tradition of documentary filmmaking and the academy, which is still my 